Thank you. Thank you. And Moose, when I was young and reading about George Gipp, I never thought I'd come back as the Gipper. <laughs> well, thank you, Reverend Malloy, and Governor, our Lieutenant Governor, distinguished guests, and a special hello to the Rockne family. I brought with me Dick Ling, our Secretary of Agriculture and Notre Dame's representative in the cabinet. <laughs> and the five, not the four, horsemen from Congress, South Bend's own Jack Heiler, our quarterback in this effort to to recognize one of America's truly great sports legends and four other distinguished alumni, Joe McDade, Dan Lundgren, Dave Martin, and Ben Blaze. It's a pleasure to visit once again the home of the Fighting Irish. With With St. Patrick's Day coming up, and after seeing those film clips, it brings to mind another deathbed scene. You know, apparently the town rogue of one small Irish hamlet lay on his deathbed as the priest prepared for the atonement. Do you renounce the devil? Do you renounce him and all his works? The priest asked. The rogue opened one eye and said, Father, this is no time for making enemies. <laughs> But it's great to be back here. I've said this before, but I want you to know the first time I ever saw Notre Dame was when I came here as a sports announcer two years out of college to broadcast a football game. You won or I wouldn't have mentioned it. <laughs> and then, of course, I was here with Pat O'Brien and a whole host of Hollywood stars for the world premiere of Knut Rockne. Now, let me explain. I may be saying the name differently, but when we made the picture, we were told, and Bonnie upheld it to us, that it was Knut, not Newt. So you'll have to get used to me saying it that way. Knut Rockne, All-American. and How I had wanted to make that movie and play the part of George Gipp. Of course, the goal was, or the role was a young actor's dream. It had a great entrance, an action middle, and a death scene right out of the opera. But it was, it was more than that. I know that to many of you today, Rockne is a revered name, a symbol of greatness, and yes, a face now on a postage stamp. But my generation, well, we actually knew the legend as it happened. We saw it unfold, and we felt it was saying something important about us as a people and a nation. And there was little room for skepticism or cynicism. We knew the legend was based on fact. I would like to interject here, if I could, that it's difficult to stand before you and make you understand how great that legend was at that time. It isn't just a memory here and of those who knew him, but throughout this nation, he was a living legend. Millions of Americans just automatically rooted for him on Saturday afternoon and rooted, therefore, for Notre Dame. Now, of course, the Rockne legend stood for fair play and honor, but you know it was thoroughly American in another way. It was practical. It placed a value on devastating quickness and agility and on confounding the opposition with good old American cleverness. But most of all, the Rockne legend meant this. When you think about it, it's what's been taught here at Notre Dame since her founding, that on or off the field, it is faith that makes the difference. It is faith that makes great things happen. 
And believe me, it took faith, and a lot of it, for an unknown actor to think that he could get the part of George Gibb. I was under contract to Warner Brothers, but I'd been all over the studio talking about my idea for a story. Having come from sports announcing to the movies, I said I thought that the movies ought to make the life story of Knut Rockne. And then one day I picked up the Daily Variety and read where Warner Brothers was announcing that they were making the life story of Knut Rockne and were starting to cast the film. Well, all I'd ever wanted was to play the Gipper if they someday made the film. I approached Pat O'Brien, who was going to play Rockne, and he'd been my choice. He told me bluntly that I talked too much, and that's where Warner's got the idea. <laughs> and I told him what my ambition was, and he said, well, they're looking for a name actor. But Pat did intervene with the head of the studio, the top producer, Hal Wallace. Hal was, to put it mildly, unimpressed with my credentials. He started by telling me I didn't look big enough for the part. Well, I wasn't very polite because I told him, you're producing the picture and you don't know that George Gipp weighed five pounds less than I weigh right now? He walked with a kind of a slouch and almost a limp. He looked like a football player only when he was on the field. And then I went home because they had told me, some cameramen had told me that the fellows in the front office they only knew what they saw on film, and I dug down in the trunk and came up with my own pictures of myself playing football in college and brought them back and showed them to Hal Wallace. Well, he finally let me do a test for the part, and Pat O'Brien, knowing of my nervousness and desire, graciously agreed to be a part of it and play in the scene with me. Well, of course, I had an advantage. I had known George Gipp's story for years, and the lines were straight from Knut Rotting's diary. And the test scene was one that said something about what Rockne liked to see in his players. It was George Gipp's first practice. You saw that scene where he was told to get into uniform. And uh, Rock told him to carry the ball. And Gipp just looked back at Rock and cocked an eyebrow and said, How far? <laughs> well, I mention all this because, as I say, Knut liked spirit in his ball players. Grantland Rice tells us that once when he was working with the four backfield stars who became known as the Four Horsemen, the fellow named Jimmy Crowley just couldn't get it right. Now, you know, I never tell ethnic jokes anymore unless they're about the Irish. <laughs> but in view of the spirit of this occasion, maybe I can be permitted some leeway. Rockney, who, by the way, was Norwegian, was commonly called the Swede. He finally got exasperated after Crowley muffed a play and hollered, what's dumber than a dumb Irishman? And without missing a beat, Crowley shot right back, a smart Swede. <laughs> well, that was Rockney. You know, not too long ago, I was questioned about the George Gipps story, and this interviewer had really done his research. In fact, he'd even gone back and talked to my old football coach, Ralph McKenzie, at Eureka College who was 91 years old, and asked him about my football career. Well, now, I've been through a lot of interviews, but believe me, I tensed up at hearing that. And apparently, Mac described me as eager, aggressive, better on defense, overall an average football player, but an outstanding talker. <laughs> well, and, uh, well, anyway, I was asked whether I knew that George Gipp was no angel that he'd played in some pool games and card games in his time. And of course, that was true, and I said so. But it was also true of George Gipp, and it is legitimately part of the legend, that he used his winnings from those games to buy food for destitute families and to help other students pay their way through Notre Dame. And the reason he got so sick and later died from pneumonia was because he had promised a former teammate who had become a high school coach, that he would give his students some pointers. Author James Cox tells us it was during that training session in Chicago that an icy wind blew in across Lake Michigan, and the Gipper first felt the ache and sore throat that would lead to the illness that would take his life. You see, there were no miracle drugs in those days, and a promising young life was ended. But the point is, George Gipp couldn't forget a friend. And I've always thought that it was no mere coincidence that the legend of George Gipp and Knut Rockne emerged from this great institution of higher learning. 
not simply because of its academic excellence, but because it stands among the winds of subjectivity for lasting values and principles that are at the heart of our civilization and on which all human progress is built. Notre Dame not only educates its students in the development of honesty, courage, and all the other things we call character. Rockne once wrote, sportsmanship means fair play. It means having a, a little respect for the other fellow's point of view. It means a real application of the golden rule. And I know a fine example of this is in the charitable care 80 of you students give the handicapped children at the Logan Center. This and other acts of goodwill say much about your generation. There are those who suggest the 1980s have been characterized by greed. Well, charitable giving is up. I think our detractors are looking in the wrong places. If they want to see the goodness and love of life of this generation, the commitment to decency and a better future, let them come here to Notre Dame. It's a place where the golden rule, the legend of Rockne, and the idea of religious faith still live. Rockne stressed character. He knew instinctively the relationship between the physical and moral. That is as true of nations as it is of people. Charles Lindbergh, also a hero of that time, once said, short-term survival may depend on the knowledge of nuclear physicists and the performance of supersonic aircraft but long-term survival depends alone on the character of man. Rockne believed in competition, yet he did not rely on brute force for winning the victory. Instead, he's remembered as the man who brought ingenuity, speed, and agility into this almost American of sports. May I interrupt myself here for a second and tell you something else about him? As a sports announcer, I was told by many of the great coaches in this land whose teams had played against Notre Dame teams under Rockne, that one of their hardest problems when playing Notre Dame was that their team worshipped Rockne, <laughs> that they were fans of his, and that when they came out in the field, the first thing they looked for was where was this great, great coach. Rockne, you see, was a man of vision, and that's how he came by his reputation as someone larger than life and a miracle man. Because of his tremendous success in sports, it's easy to forget that he was something else as well, something not too many people knew about him. He was also a man of science, having taught chemistry here at Notre Dame for four years. I must believe that he would not be at all surprised at the enormous advances that have taken place over the five decades since his death. Much has been said about the technological revolution in which we're living. Every time we turn around, it seems to be staring us in the face. Typewriters are being replaced in corporate offices throughout the country by highly efficient word processors. With the almost universal proliferation of copy machines, carbon paper has almost gone the way of the buggy whip. Not only deregulation, but design and technology have made our airlines more efficient. The American workplace in recent years has undergone a dramatic transformation. Just in the last five years, manufacturing productivity of our working people has increased 4.7 percent annually. And from the plant floor to the corporate boardroom, there is more cooperation, a sense of common purpose, more of a winning spirit, and state-of-the-art equipment and machinery available to do the job. I've seen it in the many companies that I've visited all across this nation, and I've heard it from the working people themselves. And don't let all the gloom and doomers tell you any different. There's a will to succeed evident in our land. I happen to have always believed in the American people. Don't ever sell them short. Given the proper tools and a level playing ground, our workers can outproduce and outcompete anyone anywhere. It's a, fair, a far different picture than the agonizing sight of a decade ago when many were counting out American workers in American industry. 
We were told that Americans would no longer go the extra mile, no longer have the drive to excel, that our country was in decline, and that we as a people should lower our expectations. Well, today we see an America ready to compete, anxious to compete. In fact, our workers are so productive that foreign companies are opening plants in the United States, sometimes to manufacture products for export to other countries. Our industrial base, contrary to a totally false yet widespread impression, is strong and in fact is growing. We've added almost 300,000 manufacturing jobs in the last six months, and that trend is continuing. There are over 19 million manufacturing jobs today, about the same as the last 20 years. While manufacturing output is up almost 40 percent over the last five years, and unemployment continues to decline, in short, American industry is lean and mean and ready to meet the competition head on. I predict that as this year progresses, we will see American manufacturing reemerge as the leading force in the world marketplace. Exports will, in fact, race ahead and lead our domestic economy. What is propelling our country forward? That fundamental element of the American character that no tyranny and few of our competitors can ever hope to match. Knut Rockne knew and appreciated it the creative genius and omnipresent optimism of our people. He had faith in them these last seven years, and they did the rest. That's why instead of giving up, we set our sights high. We didn't raise taxes, drain the investment pool, and tell our working people and business leaders to hunker down and prepare for the worst, to lower their expectations. We asked them to dream great dreams, to reach for the stars, we left resources in the private sector that others would have drained into the bureaucracy. The heavy investment made in our economy during the early part of this decade is paying off now in a big way. President Franklin Roosevelt once said, the only limit on our realization of tomorrow will be our doubts of today. Well, together, we, the American people, have proven the doubters wrong time and again. We've done it by keeping our eyes on the future by setting our sights on what can be done rather than complaining about how much there is to do. We've done it by viewing every problem as an opportunity. I happen to believe in something former astronaut John Swigert once said, technology and commitment can overcome any ta challenge. The individual investment made in companies large and small, the retraining of our workforce to handle the jobs in this technological age, the search for new ideas and innovative approaches, the modernization of older industries and investment in the new energy, creativity, and yes, hard work on a massive scale throughout our country from the bottom up. This is the foundation of our prosperity and the impetus for national progress. Our program has been to foster innovation and to keep our country in the forefront of change. And that's why last year, we committed ourselves to building the world's largest particle accelerator, superconducting super collider, to maintain our leadership in high energy physics research and America's scientific and technological competitiveness. That's why we're developing a space plane that by the end of the century will take off from a runway, but once at high altitude will rocket into near space and zip to its destination at 10 and even 20 times the speed of sound. And that's why I'm proposing to Congress in my fiscal year 89 budget a new Thomas A. Edison Prize program offering monetary awards to any American who can develop workable, groundbreaking technologies that could improve our quality of life. And that's why scientists right here at Notre Dame are blazing trails in superconductivity research finding ways so that this breakthrough technology can be put to use for the betterment of all mankind. Because someday, because of research being done here, transcontinental railroads will slide heavy cargoes on a magnetic cushion cheaply and quickly across the country. Perhaps our energy costs will drop below anything we could have imagined a decade ago. Rockne exemplified the American spirit of never giving up. That spirit's the reason why you and your generation are going to succeed. And that's why we're not just going to compete. 
we're going to win. And that's also why this year we'll see the return of the American Space Shuttle, symbolic of America's tenacity. We never give up. And I cannot help but believe that the heroes of the Challenger will be cheering along with the rest of us when the United States reclaims its rightful leadership role in leading the conquest of this, the last frontier. Technology in these last decades has reshaped our lives. It's opened vast opportunity for the common man and has brought all of mankind into one community. Today, worldwide communications and transportation have linked productive citizens of every free land. Through advances in medicine, our people are living longer, and the quality of their later years has been vastly improved. I like to remind people that I've already lived some 23 years longer than the average life expectancy when I was born. That's a source of frustration to a number of people. But, uh, yeah. uh, and you know, there are always those who say the problem's too big, can't be helped, let's prepare for the worst. But a few years ago, we heard well, excellence, too, is returning to our schools. We've learned what's always been known here at Notre Dame, that values are an essential part of educational excellence. Throughout the nation, parents and teachers are gaining greater control over local curriculums, emphasizing basics and making their children's education a priority in all of our lives. And they're right to do so, because all of the wonderful gains I've talked about so far, especially those gains built on the growth of technology, depend on young Americans who know how to think, calculate, write, and communicate. Now, there are those who see a dark side to our technological progress. Yes, they admit our well-being has been enhanced in so many ways. Technological advances now are making it more likely, for example, that our natural resources will be spared as long-haul telephone lines and electrical cable give way to satellite transmissions and computer chips. I spoke to the young people of Europe not long ago via our world net system and reminded them that only a short time ago such a transmission would have required thousands of tons of copper wire and other resources. Instead, our talk was transmitted quickly, cheaply, efficiently, almost miraculously from our continent to theirs via satellite. Yet it is pointed out that regretfully as man has advanced into this new age, so has his capability to kill and destroy. And it's no longer just those in uniform who are victimized. In World War I, more than 8 million military personnel lost their lives, and over 12 million civilians died. During the Second World War, almost 20 million in uniform lost their lives. However, there were about 14 million civilians killed. And if there's ever another such conflagration, a Third World War, Hundreds of millions will lose their lives, and it's estimated that 90% of the casualties will be civilian. When I was in college, I remember a debate in one of my classes. That was back in the days when the bomber was just being recognized as the potent weapon that it later became in the post-World War I days. Our class debated whether or not Americans, people who to our way of thinking stood for high moral standards, would ever drop bombs from an airplane on a city. The class was about evenly divided. Half felt it might be necessary. The others felt bombing civilians would always be beyond the pale of decency, totally unacceptable human conduct, no matter how heinous the enemy. But a decade later, few if any who had been in that room objected to our country's wholesale bombing of cities. Civilization's standards of morality had changed. The thought of killing more and more people, non-combatants, became more and more acceptable. But today, technology is pointing toward a way out of this dilemma. It's given us the promise of basing our security in the future on protection rather than the threat of retaliation. SDI offers a chance to reverse not only the nuclear arms buildup, but also to reverse the trend that in effect has put a lower and lower value on human life. Technology offers you young people who debate in today's classroom an option that threatens no one and offers a shield rather than ever sharper, more deadly swords. It offers you young people 
a chance to raise the moral standards of mankind. When I... When I came here in 1981 for one of the first major addresses of my presidency, I acknowledged the difficulties we faced in the world, not only the threat of nuclear war, but also totalitarian expansion around the world, especially in places like Afghanistan. But I also said that in avoiding these two unacceptable choices of nuclear confrontation or totalitarian rule, the West had a secret resource of strength the spiritual values of our civilization and the essential decency and optimism of our peoples. And something that got a warm response from you undergraduates, but was treated very skeptically in Washington, was my suggestion that these values were so strong and this inner strength was so great that in the long run, the West would not contain communism, we would transcend communism that the era of the nuclear threat and totalitarian darkness would someday be put behind us, that we would look again with all the people of the earth to the bright sunlit uplands of world peace, world prosperity, and yes, world freedom. How much has changed since those days? And as we look back at seven years of peace, as well as progress in arms reductions, and the hope of a Soviet exit from Afghanistan, we can be pleased that the inner strength of our nation and our civilization is increasingly apparent with every day that passes. And that inner strength, that inner strength is what Notre Dame and the legend of Rockne are all about. You know, before a big game. So he was up early in the lobby, saw two of his boys come down the stairs and go out. And then others came and followed them. And though he had a pretty good idea of what was going on, he decided to follow along. They didn't realize it, he said in his diary. But these youngsters were making a powerful impression on me. And he said, when I saw them walking up to the communion rail to receive and realize the hours of sleep they had sacrificed, I understood what a powerful ally their religion was to them in their work on the football field. And after Rockne found here at Notre Dame his own religious faith, a friend of his at the University of Maryland asked him if he minded telling him about it. Why should I mind telling you, he said. You know all this hurry and, and battling we're going through is just an expression of our inner self striving for something else. The way I look at it is that we're all here to try and find, each in his own way, the best road to our ultimate goal. I believe I found my way and I shall travel it to the end. And travel it to the end he did. And when they found him in the Kansas cornfield where the plane had gone down, they also found next to him a prayer book and at his fingertips the Rosary of Notre Dame, the Rosary of Our Lady. Someone... Someone put it so well at the time, Knut Rockne did more spiritual good than a thousand preachers. His career was a sermon in right living. Yes, we've seen more change in the last 50 years since Knut Rockne was with us than in all the other epics of history combined. You are the beneficiaries of this, and it is you who will continue the struggle and carry mankind to greater and greater heights. As Americans, as free people, you must stand firm, even when it's uncomfortable for you to do so. It won't always be easy. There'll be moments of joy, of triumph. There will also be times of despair, times when all those around you are ready to give up. It's then I want you to remember our meeting today. And sometime when the team is up against it and the brakes are beating the boys, tell them to go out there with all they've got and win just one for the gibbet. I don't know.
I don't know where I'll be then, but I'll know about it, and I'll be happy. Good luck in the years ahead, and God bless you all. Thank you. Now, Mr. President, if you would join me in... In my years here, I have seven, seldom seen such a spiral. <laughs> and amidst all of the potential recipients, he spotted Tim Brown, who caught it. <laughs> Mr. President, as an honorary degree recipient of the university and a former commencement speaker, we are a bit worried that someone is going to come up to you and ask, what are the words to the alma mater? <laughs> so lest you be disturbed by not having them memorized, as a memento of the occasion, I would like to present you with a plaque which, uh, which has the words to the alma mater, Notre Dame, our mother, presented to President Ronald W. Reagan at the Rockne Stamp Dedication Ceremony, University of Notre Dame, March 9th, 1988. And now I would invite all of us to join in singing the alma mater. <laughs> 